the American Theatre Wing, and the New York Public Library for the Performing Arts bring you the American Theatre Wing's Guide to Careers in the Theatre. This session, The Lyricist. Hello, I'm Ted Chapin with the American Theatre Wing, and with me is lyricist Sheldon Harnick. Welcome, Sheldon. Thank you, Ted. I'd, I'd like to, to, to start by just making sure everybody knows exactly who you are. I mean, I know you, among other things, as Stephen Sondheim's favorite lyricist, <laughs> I've heard him say. Um, clearly, you, you have uh, been a lyricist for a number of Broadway shows. Um, the Body Beautiful, I have a list in front of me, so I'll read The Body Beautiful, Tenderloin, Fiorello, She Loves Me, The Apple Tree, The Rothschilds, Rex, and a musical, I think, acknowledged around the world as one of the all-time greats, Fiddler on the Roof. But I also notice you have been a a composer, you have been an opera librettist, and uh, any other things I've left out? Well, I was a professional violinist, but that doesn't come under the writing uh, head. Yeah, but yeah. I thought, I'd, you know, th that's and an I've interesting... Done, uh, actually, I've done a number of translations of operas, and I've worked, I've done a couple of translations for Michel Legrand um, when we did Umbrellas of Cherbourg down at what used to be the Joe Papp uh, Theater, New York Shakespeare Festival. I translated that. I just translated a new piece he did with uh, an extremely gifted librettist he has in France named Didier Van Uh It's a piece called L'Amour Fantôme. <laughs> and I'm not going to translate <laughs> the title because the, in French it's much better than it would be in English. That sounds great. But I've, I've done that. I've, I've translated The Merry Widow for Beverly Sills um, and some others. So um, a wordsmith. But I want to talk a about the violin. You, you, you started being a violinist. I did indeed. Did you think lyrics when you were playing the violin, or did it come by accident? No, I thought safety, because the neighbors <laughs> hated what they sounded. And I, In Chicago, I wound up practicing in our attic, so people couldn't get at me. <laughs> <laughs> but then, w when did you start writing lyrics? I, di I didn't start writing lyrics, actually. My mother, back in Chicago, used to celebrate every anniversary, every bar mitzvah, every holiday, by writing a little verse little piece of doggerel. And um, my sister and I picked up that habit. I have a younger brother. He's four years younger, which apparently made all the difference. <laughs> he didn't feel required to do that. But my sister Gloria and I, we began to write verse, and I found that I really enjoyed it. So that I, I would submit poems to our grammar school paper. And when I looked back at them, I discovered they, many of them had a twist. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure why that was, but uh, I would put twists in them. And this continued into high school, where I would do, uh, I guess you'd call it light humorous verse or doggerel. And um, then I was introduced to another student there who wanted to do theater work. He wanted to be an actor. He wanted to be a writer. Uh, this was my third year in high school. And we began to write together. We wrote sketches. We wrote parodies, mostly. Mm -hmm. And then we graduated from parodies to doing original pieces of material. We, they weren't uh, songs, ballads, the publishable stuff. They really were, were comic numbers, mostly. And in fact, at one point, somebody who knew we were doing this introduced us to a struggling uh, comic in Chicago. And we sold him some material, which made him struggle even harder. <laughs> we, we sold by the yard. <laughs> we would, you could get a yard and a half for $25. Oh, I like that. It was, Dreadful stuff. It was all puns, but it was all experience. Okay, now you, but but you, you you've already said that when you did l verse as a kid, it had a twist to it. Yeah. And then you did parodies, and yeah. and then original stuff. Is that kind of a pattern? of you think if someone's interested in lyric writing, to do that kind of stuff? Well, uh, I don't know whether it's a, a a pattern, but what strikes me about doing a parody, it's like somebody who wants to be a painter and they get the exercise, go to the museum and copy such and such a painting and see what you learn. If you do a parody, that means you have to fit the same music. So you wind up doing that kind of carpentry, of making sure that, that uh, there aren't too many syllables for the uh, amount of music. So in that way, I guess it, it is a kind of exercise. And, and, and craft. So and craft, a, yes, craft. exactly. Did, did, you, um, did you learn poetry? I mean, did, did you, uh, I guess, is there a craft to be learned and to be taught, or do you have to t t t learn it yourself by trial there and error? Are, there are points that can be taught, but by and large, I think uh, lyric writing is something that you have a gift for or you don't. 
Uh, yes, uh, you can give pointers. At that time, I can't remember any place that was teaching theater, uh, teaching theater lyric writing. There are places that, that work on that now. Um, I, was not, uh, I was not knowledgeable about theater. Living in Chicago, we lived about 45 minutes from the loop, but my parents and uh, my friends were not interested in the theater, so, that, uh, so I wasn't. And as a matter of fact, one of the few things I saw was a play uh, when I was drafted into the Army. My closest friends wanted to make an event, so they took me downtown and we saw a play. I mean, it was that kind of thing. It wasn't something we went to regularly. In the Army, I found myself stationed at places, oh, in San Francisco, for instance, where they were doing uh, Carmen Jones. And I got very curious about that, so I went to see it, and I loved it. Uh, I'm leaving something out. As a violinist, I was a very good sight reader. And in high school, I remember, our school orchestra was asked whether there were any instrumentalists, violinists in particular, who were willing to play in the Goodman Orchestra for a group that was doing Gilbert and Sullivan. Mm -hmm. And I volunteered. And uh, sometimes we would just sit in the pit while they re rehearsed something just with piano. It was my introduction to the kind of uh, linguistic gymnastics that, that W.S. Gilbert was capable of. When I heard the patter songs, I thought, oh, that's wonderful. That, was, uh, uh, that whetted my interest. Also, I had an uncle, Mike, Mike Cantor, <laughs> and he, uh, he did Gilbert and Sullivan. He did plays. He was in a theater group in Chicago that did whatever the group theater did in, in uh, New York than they would do in Chicago. And he ha and a friend of his used to sing so that they would sing Gilbert and Sullivan. They would sing things like the, the uh, Ballad for Americans was very popular then. And uh, I, I became acquainted with some certain kinds of lyrics through him. So, so obviously keep your eyes and ears open to what's around you is an important lesson. Yes, yeah. Yes, well, you mentioned something else. My mother once asked me and my, uh, the guy I was collaborating with, Stanley Orsi, she asked us if we would write some material, uh, do a sketch for her bridge club. She was hostess, and she had supplied the food, and she thought it might be fun if we did a sketch. She gave us all of the material that we were to use. She told us about Pansy Lieberfarb and her <laughs> idiosyncrasies and this one and that one. And we just took all those things and put them into this little uh, two-man sketch that we wrote. And pe the ladies screamed with laughter. Of course they loved it. <laughs> yes, and that was a very important lesson, that write what the audience knows, you know, uh, uh, what they're familiar with, and they will respond. I found that true in the Army, too. Now, and in a way, that's what I have always known as, as industrial shows in the great era of the Millikan show and stuff like that, which I don't think they're happened. I don't think they're doing them that Not much the Millican. anymore. There are still Other industrial shows. Where, in essence, what you're doing is writing a musical for a specific, for Mrs. Lieberfarb and what, with the Mrs. whoever they are, so that you're telling exa them what they want to know exactly. or what they need to know. Yes, exactly. That's, 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 that's so good. So we've been going around in circles, but all of these things uh, whetted my interest in words, in verse, in language, uh, so that by the, t by the time I was drafted at the age of 18 and went into the Army, uh, I was stationed in Georgia for some time, and every Monday night there was a show. Whoever volunteered at, at 6 o'clock was in the show at 8. And I thought, I'm going to write some songs about my unit. Uh, and, and see how they play. So I did. And they were received uh, very enthusiastically because I was describing in rhyme and with my own music, uh, such as it was at the time, I was writing about things they all knew about. Mm -hmm. And they, the response was very gratifying. It was another confirmation of this thing, write what you know. But did you ha add the twist? Uh, I, I don't think I had to at that time. Um, just so that we're all on, on, on the same ground. A, a, a lyricist, by definition, is, is, is he or she who provides the words? A lyricist provides the words to the music. Uh, this is not to state that the words necessarily have to come before the music is written. Sometimes the music is written. But in a song, there are lyrics and there are music, and the lyricist provides the words. In, in your ex experience, do you, this is the basic question of all lyricists or composers, which comes first, words or music? And that all depends on the team that's writing and how they like to write. There are composers, and I've worked with them, 
uh, when, when Richard Rodgers and I wrote Rex. It turned out that, for various reasons, he wanted all the lyrics written first, which was, I think, pretty much the way he worked when he worked with Oscar Hammerstein. Mm -hmm. I've worked with composers uh, who, uh, I've worked with Marvin Hamlish, who can set lyrics and set them very well, but given his preference, he wants to write the music first, and that can be very helpful. Do you, do you find in that instance that a, a composer who's writing the music first is thinking of lyrics, or is a, and, and if a lyricist is writing music, f if the lyrics come first, is he, is he and are you thinking of the music at the same time? Can they be, can they be written in a vacuum, I guess? Um, that's a good question, because I don't know the answer, come to think of it, for all my experience. I don't know when a composer sits down whether, let me venture a guess, quite often he will have a title in mind, uh, but other times he is thinking more of the emotional ambiance of the song than he is of the specific lyric content, uh, so that he will write it uh, thinking this is going to be a, a love song, this is going to be a comedy song, this will have trenchant political comment, right, right. but that will determine the style of the song rather than specific lyrics. I think on occasion a smart and experienced composer will think, I believe that my lyricist is going to need a lot of notes to say the things that have to be said, so instead of giving this a lyrical line with few notes, I will provide him with a lot of notes. Right, right. Well, it's funny, I was looking at this songbook on, on the way down here, and, and one song along these lines fascinated me, which is When Messiah Comes, a song that was cut from Fiddler on the Roof, which is, I believe, in three-quarter time, which you don't really feel it doesn't feel like a waltz, certainly, mm -hmm. but then there are wonderful moments when, because it's kind of a soliloquy, there are a whole lot of words. Yeah. You know, and, I, and w w did you write the lyrics for that first? The lyrics to that came first. And yeah. did it seem very clear to, to, to the composer, to, to Jerry Bach, that uh, this, this should be a sort of... Uh, I don't... I, probably it did, I think, in that particular song, but uh, although I may be getting ahead of myself, uh, because I'll get into the relationship with Jerry Bach, Jerry and I have a specific way of working. I have never worked this way with anyone else. Jerry, who's, who can set lyrics excellently or write music first excellently, either uh, they're on a par, Jerry and I would know what the source material was. And once we knew what that was and we'd had our meetings with the man who was writing the book, the script, uh, we knew we were all going the same direction, Jerry would then go into his studio, and he would start to write music. He would write individual numbers, and when he had anywhere from 6 to 20, he would put them on tape. And then he would send me the tape. All of this time, I was at home thinking, what would be the easiest lyric to write to get the momentum going? And uh, I would have some ideas as to what that uh, lyric might be. Then I would, and I would wait until I got the tape in the mail. Mm -hmm. And the tape always started with, Shell, I think this number is for the butcher in such and right. such a scene. I think this number is for the tailor in the other scene. This number, I don't know what the hell this is, but I, I like it. And I would listen to all of the numbers on the tape, and invariably there were a couple that uh, fit notions I had, or there were a couple where the music excited me so much, I would drop everything and think, oh, I've got to set that particular piece of music. Um, and Jerry was extraordinarily generous because, as I say, a tape might have as many as 20 musical numbers, although that was rare. And out of that whole tape, I might feel, rightly or wrongly, that there were only three or four songs or less, or fewer, mm -hmm. less, fewer. <laughs> um, <laughs> alert, that, alert. <laughs> you've got to be careful. <laughs> so, um, those, all those unused melodies would go back into his trunk. But that's the way we would start. It always started with music first. Then, uh, at a certain point in the development, I would think, I have an idea for a song, it's a comedy song, or it's a point song of some sort, and I don't want to be constrained by music. This is going to be, perhaps, hard to write. I want the absolute freedom uh, to write unhampered or un unconstrained by music. So then I would create a lyric. And with a comedy lyric, quite often, you get the first chorus, then you go into the second chorus and find that the, the joke you find doesn't have the same meter 
as the joke in the first chorus. So then you think, well, let's see, one of these has got to be rewritten, or maybe both, and you try and rewrite them so that they both have the same general uh, metrical structure. Uh, otherwise, the composer has to keep writing new melodies. Mm -hmm. um, and at a certain point, I would give these to Jerry Bach, and Jerry, as I say, uh, was wonderful at setting lyrics. However, I would, while I was writing, since I do write music and I am a musician, I would invariably find myself thinking of a melody. And there were occasions early on when Jerry would play something for me and I would think to myself, huh, it's not as good as my melody. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, this is very dangerous. And worse than that, I would write with a very specific rhythmic pattern in mind. I would think this is in 2-4. Right. And I would give the lyric to Jerry and he would hear it as 3-4. Most of the time when he did that, it came as a very refreshing surprise. I thought, oh, oh, I never would have thought of that, but isn't that wonderful? On occasion, I would think, no, nope, I think that hurts the lyric. And when we had arguments, we didn't have many, but occasionally we would have arguments, that's when the arguments occurred. I said, no, this would be more effective in two. Please don't do it in three. What are you talking about? It's great <laughs> three, and so forth. Um, so what I learned was if I was thinking of a melody, I learned not to. That's I thought, let me conceive this rhythmically. So if Jerry, and later this applied to other composers as well, if they said, I don't hear the rhythmic pattern you have in mind, I was prepared to say, it's this and lay it out for them. I said, oh, I see. Now, you can use that, or if you hear it another way, do it another way. But I was trying to be very careful not to think of melodies. Uh, and it wasn't as difficult as, as I would have thought. I would just let the kind of, if a melody was forming, I would let it blur in my mind and turn it into something that had no specific melodic contour because it made it much better. I didn't have to compare what he wrote with what I was writing. W where would the librettist come into this conversation between you and Jerry? Generally, when uh, w we would know, well, let me be specific. For instance, uh, when we did Fiddler on the Roof, one of the first songs that we did, uh, when, when we spoke to Joe Stein and we would have meetings about which way the book was going to go, there were certain moments in the original stories by Sholem Aleichem, which we know no matter what we did, those moments in the stories had to be there. They were key moments. And one of the key moments is when uh, Tevya has given permission for his oldest daughter to marry the, the man of her dreams, the tailor, and, and not marry the butcher, and he's already given her hand to the butcher. Right. And he thought, how do I get out of this? How do I tell my wife? How do I persuade her to change her mind? I know, I will have a dream. My wife is very superstitious. I'll tell her the dream and, and that'll solve the problem. So we thought that moment has to stay. Right. So that when Jerry went into his studio, one of the pieces of music he sent me, believe it or not, because it's, it's very uh, comple complex, was the music for the dream. Oh. I don't remember offhand whether I had to elongate that and elaborate it by inventing a lyric for a section which was missing. I think it was all there. Um, so that, that's one thing um, where you know So that it was part of the original conception and it, was, it, it became very clear to the three of you that this was a moment that had to be your department more than it... Right. Uh, librettists, as they know and as I know, librettists with experience know that they have to be extremely generous because they will write a wonderful scene and the lyricist will come in and say, you know something, there's a big part of that scene would be even more effective as a song. And some of your jokes <laughs> would be wonderful in that in, song. In my song. <laughs> and they say, be my guest. They well, know. in a collaboration they have to, right? In a collaboration they, they have to. And I try and repay that by, if I think of something good for the book, I say, can you use this? Mm -hmm. You know, and I take no credit for it. But here, that... It's a quid pro quo. So uh, as the songs get written, then they have to be played for the librettist because quite often uh, the song in itself doesn't fill the entire spot that it's meant for. So what can has you get the librettist up to a point? Right. The librettist then has to supply 
just the right words that lead into the song and just the right, right words that lead away from the song once it's finished. So it's a very close collaboration all the way between the book writer and the composer and the lyricist. Do you find jokes in lyrics in situations like that easy? No, I find them very difficult. I admire. I mean, you people. do them very well, and that's a loaded question, perhaps. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, I find them very difficult. And my hat goes off to people like Fred Ebb, who seem to be able to supply them <laughs> just at will. Uh, I find them very difficult. Uh, but you search, you work, and, and you try, and, and with any luck, and uh, with great faith in God <laughs> and con contributions to the synagogue fairly regularly, <laughs> you, you they come. But I, I also have, have found in my own just, you know, looking and going to, to musicals that there are times when you will, can read a lyric on a page that you don't think is a joke, you don't think it's funny, and then you hear it in the theater and in the context, and suddenly it's just but ba but on but on in the song, and it lands. I did that. <laughs> I, I, um, when we were working on, again, Fiddler, I had an idea for a song uh, for the moment where the uh, second daughter uh, wants to marry the revolutionary, Perchik, and Tevye has given her permission to marry the revolutionary, and he has to tell Golda. And they do a song, uh, Do You Love Me? And I thought, I know there's a funny beginning to this song, given that's, a, that's society, where love generally was not an issue. There were arranged marriages in that community. So I thought, if Tevye says, He's thinking, here are my daughters, they're marrying for love. This is unusual. Right. And, he said, and he turns to his wife and says, Golda, do you love me? And I thought, she's got to answer, do I what? Right. <laughs> what are you talking about, you crazy person? I thought that would be very funny. But I didn't know where to go from it, I'd go with it from there. Our pre-Broadway tour was in Detroit. So once we got to Detroit, I thought, let me try and write that song. And I would go for long walks every day, and I would be very happy if I could write four lines. And at the end of the week, and I thought, I can't spend any more time on this one song. We've got a lot of work to do. I, th I finished it. I was looking for a joke to finish this song, and I couldn't find it. So I thought, all right, let me do something else. Uh, and I wrote something that wasn't a joke. Um, then you love me, I suppose I do, and I suppose I love you too. It doesn't change a thing, but even so, after 25 years, it's nice to know. I thought it's a sweet ending. Right. So I gave the, this, uh, and by the way, the form of this lyric, the shape of it, looked like a dialogue scene. It didn't look like a song. Yeah. I didn't know what else to do with it, and I gave it to Jerry with uh, the instruction that I usually did. I, I won't say instruction, that's too strong a term, but <laughs> saying, uh, here it is, see if you can find music for it, whatever, if you have to change it, I will rewrite the lyric to fit the music. Um, and he said it almost exactly as I wrote it, which was a surprise. We played it for our producers, they said, that's fine. That's nice. <laughs> well, they're in, tr they're in trouble out of town like everybody right, else. Yeah, we're, yeah. And we gave it to Zero Mostel and Maria Kornelova, and they loved it. And they said, oh, let us learn this and try and put it in tonight. And by God, they did. So I went to the theater to hear it. And to my surprise, it got to the last four lines, which were just supposed to be a sweet ending. And there was a laugh. I thought, I guess that's funny. I didn't realize <laughs> that, but it's funny. But that also brings up an another thing. I was fortunate enough to be a production assistant on the Rothschilds, and one of the things that I remember observing that was that in the first day of rehearsal there was a score, and it was a complete score, and it had some, a lot of wonderful songs in it, and a, the a, a concept of sort of every s society that the Rothschilds were ex ex excluded from is auctioned mm -hmm. off. And then what I remember seeing was as the show did its usual out-of-town troubles and whatever, each of the, there were a lot of songs written out of town in, in that show, and it seemed to me that each song became, you know, suddenly more focused. Mm -hmm. So my question is, does that happen where, where by force of, of everything else, is that you become more focused? Jerry doesn't have the time or didn't have the time to do a lot of tapes and stuff, but suddenly you're in the room and it's got to be in by tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Does it help focus the craft? Absolutely. Um, when you write a show, in a certain sense, no matter how much experience you have, everything is theoretical. 
and you don't know what you've accomplished until it's played before an audience. And the audience tells you whether, whether all of the points you were trying to make are getting across, whether the jokes you're telling are funny, whether the, the lyrics that are meant to move people are actually moving, whether, they, whether anything is incomprehensible, that happens. So that uh, suddenly the theory becomes very real. And the wonderful thing, in the old days, it's not done so much anymore, the wonderful thing used to be the pre-Broadway tryout. Because while you were on the road for three weeks or six weeks, whatever it was, that was your job. You had no other job. Your children could starve. Your wife could run <laughs> off with another man. That didn't matter. You your one job was to do those lyrics. And it was like the best laboratory in the world because Jerry didn't have to write tapes to me. He was there. We right. could, and we knew from looking at the show, we said, this works. Great. That works. This doesn't work. We've got to fix that. So that became a very specific thing. And not only that, um, when you see it, you see the actors. The actors bring things to it which you didn't know were there. Or maybe you hoped they were there, but you weren't sure. And in many cases, they bring values to the show as the characters take life. Uh, the characters show you things about the, the show you didn't know. Um, unless you're like Jerome Robbins and George Abbott, men with both the experience and the psychological uh, acuity, I guess would be the word, to know pretty much what was going to work. They didn't uh, always. Ahead of time. Yeah. They didn't always, but most of the time they did. Certainly they, they knew more than, uh, than Jerry Bach and I and uh, Joe but Steiner. But also, also when you started to work with, with them, they were both, they had more experience than you had. They, they had, and through the years I found that I, I uh, developed a greater sense of what was going to work, but I don't think I ever had that gift as great as George Abbott uh, and and uh, Robbins and other people. Abbott, I remember when we did Fiorello, we wrote a lyric uh, called The Bum One, which was for a group of hack politicians. They, uh, they didn't think LaGuardia, their candidate, they didn't think he had a chance. Right. So they didn't do much to help him, and he won. And there's this meeting of consternation afterwards. He won. He won. Now he's going to be an independent. He doesn't need us. Right, right. So we wrote a song called The Bum Won. And George Abbott didn't think it would work. So he said, I am not going to put it in for the opening out of town in New Haven. And uh, we tried to persuade him. But at a certain point, you thought, there's too many other problems to solve. Let's not waste his time and ours by arguing about that. Then to my surprise, once we got to New Haven, he said, I think it's your privilege to see what this song looks like on stage. It won't be in for the opening, but as soon as we've opened, as soon as that's out of the way, then we can rehearse the men in the song. I'm not going to waste our producer's money by having an orchestration made, so you're going to have to do it with bass, drum, and piano. That's all. But we'll see whether the song works. And I thought, that's wonderfully fair. So the first night that the song went in, I stood in the back of the theater next to George Abbott, and I watched the song, and I thought, he's right. It doesn't work. And I turned to him to say, Mr. Abbott, I never called him George, right. uh, to say, Mr. Abbott, you were right. But before I could say anything, he looked at me and said, Sheldon, that song is going to work. You've got to do this, <laughs> this, and this, and then it'll work. And right. I thought, my God, OK. So we did this, this, and this, and it worked. And I thought, that's not just experience. That's something, that's a gift wow. that he has. You know. Uh, and it's that gift which allowed him to, to be successful so much of the time. That's an amazing story. <laughs> yeah. And also, I mean, it all goes back to collaboration and to trust your collaborators and listen to them. Yes. Yeah. I think that's Yes, great. right. Um, we have here some, some, there, there are some books on the table I wanted to ask you about. I mean, they, they sort of look like dictionaries and th th thesauri. Well, before I came here, um, Betty Corwin uh, had, uh, I don't know her exact title <laughs> with, this, with this project, but anyway, Betty said, what tools do you use? What would be helpful for somebody who is not a lyricist but who would like to be? And I thought, what tools do I use? Well, of course, uh, one of the tools, which I don't have here, is always the source material. For instance, when we did Fiorello, it was all the biographies of uh, Fiorello LaGuardia. For Tenderloin, it was a novel. Uh, by Samuel Hopkins Adams, and we based our show on that novel. That was the source material. For Fiddler on the Roof, it was uh, all of the stories that Sholem Aleichem wrote about uh, Te Tevye the Dairyman. So the source material is all important. 
If it's an original, then it's the original story that the book writer writes. But then, when the technical job comes in of providing lyrics, the tools that I use are dictionary. I didn't bring a dictionary. I don't have to. But for those people who have never seen a rhyming dictionary, this is one. And uh, it's a particularly good one. There are several. This is my favorite. Uh, it's gone through a number of editions because, of course, the language keeps changing. New words keep creeping into the lexicon, and they're added as rhymes. It's, uh, the book is structured in a way that makes it very easy to use. For instance, I turned by accident to rhymes for the word, for the sound A. Then there's for the sound ert, us. Right. There's whatever sound you want, you, it, you turn to that page and there will be all the rhymes. So do you tend to, to use that if you have one line of a lyric and you want to find a rhyme for it? Exactly. Um, in passing, I will say that Johnny Mercer, who was a supreme lyricist, never used this or the thesaurus because what he found was it got in his way. He didn't want to have to stop his thinking process to consult a book. He would just, he would rather have kept going, kept that momentum going. I find it doesn't uh, break my thought. I can go right back to it. What, what will happen quite often is that you know how you want to end a song, be it a comedy song or a ballad. You've got something, you think, oh, that's a lovely line. I'm going to use that. Now, how do I lead up to that? <laughs> And before you use the book, you go through your mind, or I do, thinking, okay, I've used the word um, love. Right. Now, what do I rhyme with that? Above, shove. Oh, that's a, no, not for love. Um, right. And so for right. turtle dove. And you think, mm, none of these are right. Then you go to the dictionary and say, uh, I haven't thought of everything. What have I left out? Right. And what, that's where this and thing it is may, useful. And it may prompt you into another direction that you hadn't thought of. Exactly. It, it, because... With my mind, at any rate, uh, I won't speak for somebody as brilliant as Stephen Sondheim, for instance. He may be able, like a computer, to just go down the rhymes in his mind. Oh, I find that I leave things out. He uses a rhyming dictionary. He says <laughs> he does. Oh, absolutely. But what he says is that the clever rhymes that he uses often, you'll never find in there. No, you won't find in here. That's, those are the, fu the ones you don't want to because they're the most fun of anything, right. pr providing those very clever what, rhymes. What's your favorite of, of those of yours? Of mine? Oh, I don't know if I have any one that comes to mind at any rate, was uh, in The Body Beautiful, which is not a successful show, the uh, character is singing about the woman he loves, Gloria. And he's, Gloria, you're so dainty, you're so feminine, you're a cup of tea with lemon in. <laughs> <laughs> And those, those are great fun Steve to do. Steve Sondheim ripped you off then. He, 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 he told me that he, he used you. Let's put it that way. Yeah, he, he <laughs> said, you know, yours? He said, I think I got a better one. <laughs> and it may have been. So this is one tool. This is an even more valuable tool. And this is the thesaurus. Because lyric writing, to a great extent, is the art of substitution. Especially when you're writing to music. You know what the musical phrase is. And you have an idea to fit that phrase. And then it doesn't fit because the key adjective has too many syllables. And you don't want to, and it, the, you want to preserve that thought, but you say, how do I do that? Well, I'll look for another adjective. So the thesaurus will tell you uh, adjectives, verbs, uh, nouns. They will give you the substitute word. You, first, of course, before you do this, you use your own imagination. And when you can't think of a word that has the right resonance, the right sound, the right poetic feeling, then you think you go to this. And sometimes you find the word, the exact words you're looking for, and that's really a sense of, Eureka! Yes. Oh, I've done it. Thank there you. There it was waiting for me. Thank you. Other times, as you said before, you will find something and you think, ooh, wait a minute. Maybe I don't need that original sentence. This could throw me into a whole new image, a whole new thought. Uh, and so this can be helpful in many ways, but it's, it, it helps to find those substitute words when you're really stuck and you've got to fit the music because usually one does not ask the composer to change the music. He, they, and most composers don't like to. Right. They think musically and what, what they find that satisfies them is a phrase that's all of a piece. What you can do and what they will allow sometimes, you want to start your thought with the or a, and you need that extra, the. what we call an upbeat, right. you know, a pickup note. And they say, oh, sure, use that, you know. 
But I'm told that Julie Stein, who was, again, one of the best theater composers, if somebody said, you know, this, uh, what you've written is wonderful, but here at this place, I need three extra syllables, Julie would say, I won't do that. I love what I've written, and that stays, and I'll use it some other place, but I'll write a whole new song to accommodate your lyric, this new lyric. But I'll leave the, that melody alone. Yes, I will leave that melody alone. Uh, I'm reminded of something else. Something you said before reminded me. When I came to New York in 1950, and I just covered my <laughs> microphone. When I came to New York in 1950, my icon was uh, Yip Harburg. Finian's Rainbow was a work of art to me. I was introduced to him, and I played for him. And he gave me some very good advice in different directions. But one of the things that he was strongest about, he said, when you work with a composer, he said, always listen to the composer and try and serve his needs. Because uh, the stronger the melody is, the stronger the lyric will be. He said, don't just fight with him and say, no, I can't change that adjective. It's got to stay. Serve the composer. And I think that advice grew out of this situation. He listened to the songs I'd written, and especially my comedy songs would start with recitative. It was practically just dialogue set to perfunctory music. Mm -hmm. And he listened, and he said, Sheldon, don't do that. He said, always make the music as graceful and as appealing as you can. Because what's going to happen, especially with a comedy song, the first time the audience hears it, they will laugh. The second time they hear it, they know the jokes. And the things that makes, keeps that alive is the charm of the music. He said, for instance, he said, Bert Lane and I did a song for Finian's When I'm Not Near the Girl I Love. And he said his original setting of it was like a 2-4 dance tune. And I, uh, to me, I thought it wasn't right. And we fought about it. We argued about it. And he said, eventually, Burton agreed with me. And he wrote this absolutely lovely waltz. Dee -da -dum, ba -dum, ba -dee -dum. Now when you hear the song, you know the jokes are coming. But they are supported and enhanced by that wonderful, gracious melody. So the song will last. So he, so he said, don't write recitative. And then uh, out of that came a see. And when you do have a composer, and he says, please change this for me. Try and change it. It's important. Do, do you think that, as a rule, composers are as sensitive to the needs of the lyricist as that story indicates that the lyricists have to be The sensitive? good ones are, yes. The good ones, and they're the ones that succeed, the good ones are very sensitive to lyrics. Many of them are capable of writing lyrics. Richard Rogers was. He wrote some good ones. Jerry Bach is. Um, I'm not sure of the others. But they have to be very sensitive to lyrics. I'm, who was it? Uh, one of the operetta writers whose highest praise was, yes, it fits. It fits. It fits. Who was that? That was... I well, I, I, I had heard that, that Mr. Rogers said that to Mr. Hammerstein from time to time, but um, I don't know the operetta. No, it was uh, one, of the, uh, one of the guys the from the turn of the century. Or I, not Victor Herbert, but one of those ones. One of those. Yeah. Um, oh, the other tool I yeah. use is this kind of paper. Uh, some people use yellow paper. I like the, the white. They're legal pads. And I found out I used to use them when they were this long. Really? And then I found I couldn't store them in my filing cabinet. So now I use them this long. But they're lined, and they're very comfortable to write on. Do, do ideas get jotted down on there, or do you wait until you have a, a semblance of order? Um, I will jot down ideas quite often when I'm starting a lyric, and I don't know where it's going. I don't have a title, but I kind of know in general what the subject matter is. I'll have an idea for a line. And then I thought, that's a good line. And then I'll write down uh, in the margin here all of the rhymes that I can think of for that, hoping that maybe one of those rhymes will throw me into a whole new idea. Uh, I write down, and I notice this about my own writing. When I start, I write very large. Mm -hmm. So there may not be much on any given page. Then I turn the page. As, as I begin to focus in on a lyric, the writing gets smaller. <laughs> then when I have a complete lyric, and especially if it's a long <laughs> lyric, it becomes all microscopic because I want to have it all the on whole one lyric page. <laughs> That's one of my idiosyncrasies. I remember Steve Sondheim giving the advice that each song should have its own pad. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, that is useful. 
What I find even more useful, and I didn't used to do it, but I do it religiously now, I always do page one and the date and the title so that I know I can go back and look and find the progress of a song. Or I may remember, gee, I did something that was better, a better version than what I'm now writing, and that was early. Let me go look at that. And, it, it, and when they're dated and when they're titled, it becomes a very w easy way to retrieve them. That's great. I like the idea of one lyric per pad. That means you only have that many pages to come up to <laughs> with the lyric. Right. I mean, yeah. did, uh, did you graduate with an English degree? I mean, obviously, a, a, you know, a knowledge of the English language is key for all of this. No. I, I, um, I was a great reader as a kid. I loved to read. I did not read poetry. Uh, except for what we were required to in school. But um, I read a lot. When, but I was a, a violinist, and I thought that was going to be my life. So that when I was in the Army, um, I, at one point I had my violin sent to me, and I played uh, the USOs. I was in the hospital briefly for a foot infection, and I hooked up with a guitar player, and he gave me the ultimate compliment. He said, he said, "You wanna after the after the war? Why don't we form an act? We'll, I'll design you a cowboy suit, and we'll play fiddle and guitar. It'll be good." <laughs> it was tempting because I didn't know what I wanted to do. But I got out of the army, and before I had gone to the army, uh, another violinist who was older than I was was already at Northwestern University. And I had gone with him to see their big student review, the WAMU show, and it was wonderful. So when I got out of the Army, I thought I applied to Northwestern because it was good music school, and I thought I'll get uh, my degree, I'll be a violin major, and either I'll be a professional or I'll teach. But I also wanted to go there because I knew that I enjoyed writing. And that would give you an And outlet. that would give me an outlet for the songs I wrote, the WAMU show. Then what happened, to keep this brief, uh, was that my friend Charlotte Ray, who was at school, Charlotte went to New York about my junior year, and she saw Finian's Rainbow. She came back to school after the break, and she loaned me the album and said, you of all people should hear this. I heard it, and I thought, that's what I want to do. So I stopped being about, I graduated, and then I came to New York to write Finian's Rainbow. <laughs> um, and that's how I got into it. Uh, when I wrote for the One You Show, the first year I was there, I had one song in it. The second year, I had four songs. The third year, I had six songs. And uh, as a matter of fact, there was a radio personality in Chicago, Dave Garraway, who later became sure. a television personality in New York. He came backstage, and I asked him, I said, Mr. Garraway, is there a place for someone uh, who writes lyrics like me is on your show? He said, well, we're going to New York, and our budget comes from there, and if you have any ideas of writing lyrics professionally, I would go to New York. And that was one of the influences that made me go. That and Charlotte Ray, who had already moved there and said, oh. you could have a career. That this, is a, this is a place that's happening. Do you know, and do you have any recommendations of, of training programs or education programs for lyricists? When I was starting, there were no such things. But now, uh, uh, NYU Theater sc School has a, uh, a course, a program, for people who want to be, uh, who want to write songs for shows. They, uh, ASCAP has a program to develop theater writers. So does BMI. Uh, there are probably others, but those are the ones that come to mind. You, you mentioned when you first came to New York, and Yip Harburg, E.Y. Harburg, was 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 graceful and great, and uh, mm -hmm. you know, and had allowed you to play songs and, and comment to, to you. Do you have you done that for others? Yes, uh, both privately and uh, I've been on panels for the ASCAP workshop and the BMI workshop and uh, NYU. And as a matter of fact, um, Lonnie Price, who's a young actor-director who directed the very successful revival of Rothschilds off-Broadway some years ago, Lonnie uh, is, I've forgotten whether this is at NYU or where he's teaching. Music theater work? No. Oh, uh, Wherever it is, uh, I'm going to be listening to songs along with another, a very gifted young writer named Michael John Lacusa, the two of us will listen to songs by the aspiring theater songwriters and then uh, give our input, our critique. And it's, it's important. Yeah. I also serve on the Richard Rogers Foundation when people apply for grants for the shows they've written. It's important. Yeah. Do, um, in in, the, in the, the musical theater, who is it who hires the lyricist? Uh, presumably, it would be the producer. 
Um, if the producer is working hand in glove with the director, uh, the director may be the one who's the influence and who suggests the lyricist. Uh, but I think usually it's the producer. I certainly, uh, when uh, when I began to work with Jerry Bach, I had been trying to write my own music. That was another thing. When I played for Yip Harburg, he listened to what I did, and um, he said, you know, in my opinion, and by the way, I think this is still true, he said, in my opinion, there are more capable theater composers than there are theater lyricists. So you can facilitate your career by working with people besides yourself. And I thought, that's interesting. Okay, I will take him at his word. And shortly after that, I had the occasion to work with a very gifted young man named David Baker. And then when Jerry Bach broke up with his then partner and was looking for a lyricist, someone recommended me, and we began to work together and found that we were very compatible. Uh, are some of the shows that you have done shows that you and or Jerry Bach or somebody else came up with the idea yourself and then you would take to a producer? The only one that we did was uh, uh, Fiddler when somebody had recommended another book by Sholem Aleichem and, and uh, Jerry Bach and I liked it. We weren't sure. We asked Joe Stein and he said, not this one, but let's read more Sholem Aleichem. So we found... So it started with the authors. Yeah. But uh, up until that point, all of the shows I had done were suggested. They were brought to us by producers. And uh, I think as often as not, that's the way it works. And it's a very nice way to work because that way uh, you have a producer who's interested in getting the things on. When you write a show first, then it's a matter of selling it to a producer, uh, somebody who's going to be interested in it to the point of doing the hard work, and it is hard work, to raise the money and make sure that it's the right show and cast it and all the rest of it. It's hard. Um, how do lyricists get paid? W um, when I started, it was a very simple arrangement. The Dramatist Guild uh, had a contract where the, there was a minimum, and it was split three ways, 6%. And that 6% could be split whatever way the book writer, the lyricist, and the composer wanted. But generally, it was 2% for the book writer, 2% for the lyricist, and 2% for the composer. And this uh, obtained for many, many years. It was very neat. But in the last, I don't know how many years, other ways of getting paid, now there are uh, profit pools, and they're, they're rather complex arrangements of who gets what percentage, and so it's, uh, and I'm not even capable of describing it. Uh, it doesn't, usually it doesn't come to as much as the 2%, but the profit pools were invented because it was getting harder and harder to get investors uh, to invest in shows because it took longer and longer for the show to pay off and for the investors to get their money back. So now, there are different ways we get paid, but it's still more than adequate. With a, with a flop show, it doesn't matter because nobody's going to make any money. With a hit show, you still make a great deal of money. And that 2% that is 2% of the box office gross? That was 2% of the box office gross. Less yeah. taxes and now credit and card agents, charts and agents', agents commissions, commissions and yeah, on and on and, and on. So forth. If, um, and I don't want to make this an indelicate question, but if you did not have Fiddler on the Roof, um, w would you have, a, have a, a livelihood off everything else that you've written? I would, but it wouldn't, it wouldn't be nearly as uh, uh, elegant, say, yes. <laughs> as it is now. Um, because She Loves Me uh, brings in a nice income. Fiorello, which was a Pulitzer Prize winner, is, uh, I, I think, many people think of it as a political show. They don't realize that uh, it's a love story. It's a double love story. But Fiorello, uh, the, uh, a wonder, the version of A Wonderful Life that I did with Joe Raposo, which mm -hmm. Rodgers and Hammerstein handles, there would be I'll enough uh, so that I would make an income. But Fiddler put me into a different category and allows me to live where I now live. Right, which, is a, which is great. <laughs> D do you um, know of apprenticeships for lyricists, or is, that a, it is, a, is it a lonely <laughs> career? Well, nowadays, <laughs> What, uh, through the Dramatist Guild, which I'm a, a council, loyal council member of, what we try to do and uh, generally do, almost every composer lyricist, composer or lyricist or team, knows uh, struggling, aspiring mm -hmm. young talents. You meet them, somebody will introduce them, and there are people about whose work 
one is enthusiastic. When you have a show that's going into rehearsal, what the Drama's Guild has recommended is to remember to invite those people along and make them part of the team. They will be observers. They will learn a lot. They also are very handy at getting coffee. Right, right. But they, they, will, they will look, they will, uh, I haven't done this myself, uh, but others have said quite often they will come up with usable suggestions. And they know they're not going to be paid for. Not only to see how a show is assembled, the practicalities of it, but to see the, the fights, the arguments, the temperaments, uh, the, the heartbreaks, everything that goes into producing a show. It's a wonderful thing, and I look forward to being able to do that myself. Yeah, no, I, and I certainly know as, as one who has done that, if, you're, if, if the apprentice is really willing to get the coffee <laughs> at the same time that they're really interested in paying attention to what's going on, you can learn an incredible amount. We had, not with lyricists, but uh, I did a show, Tenderloin, and I think, the f I think there was a Ford grant at the time that allowed people to come along with the show, and then the Ford grant paid their expenses. On Tenderloin, we had two extraordinarily gifted young men, James and Bill Goldman. They were brothers. Uh, James wrote uh, The Lion of Winter. Bill Goldman did many, many uh, successful movies, Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, among others. And they were observers. Uh, Tenderloin was in so much trouble that at one point George Abbott began to bring them into it and anybody else who anybody. had any good <laughs> ideas so that they got roped into it and, uh, and uh, they came up with a lot of ideas. I don't remember whether we used them or not. But uh, it's wonderful for the people who are doing the show and it's wonderful for the people who get that opportunity to be included. What kind of recommendations would you have to someone who wants to be a lyricist for the Broadway musical? Um, uh, several. One is to read a lot. I, uh, before I answer that a little more fully, about 15 years ago, maybe a little longer, I thought, here I am, a successful lyricist, and I don't know poetry. So I thought, I'm finally going to begin to acquaint myself with poetry. And I had been reading, uh, the name Shelley kept cropping up, not as a poet, but as a, a, a social commentator. So I thought, well, Shelley, that's kind of a namesake of mine. <laughs> I'll start with him. So I, and I was reluctant to because I thought, I'll bet this is intellectually beyond me. <laughs> and I started reading it, and to my delight, I found it wasn't beyond me at all. And suddenly, uh, it became this wonderful candy store. And since then, I've always read about five pages a day of who, whatever poet I'm reading, I'm trying to alternate between the old poets and the new poets. And what it does is to sharpen one's appreciation of language. Uh, it also gives one a sense of humility. I find that Robert Browning used all the clever rhymes that Ogden Nash and all the rest of us <laughs> used 100 years ago. Um, so that's one thing, to, to read poetry, to, to sharpen one's perception of language. Then the other thing is to be, be familiar with the literature, because this country has been uh, I think singularly blessed in the number of superb lyricists that has produced uh, going way back to the turn of the century from George M. Cohan on and up through uh, uh, Harbach and Cole Porter and Gershwin and, and there's a raft of them and they still come one after the other and I'm, and I'm proud to be one, one of that lineage. At any rate, to become familiar with what they've done to see as many shows as possible, which can be expensive, never the, or if you can't see them, then get the uh, albums, get the, the CD, read the play, uh, try and think what, why the songs were written that way. Try writing. Uh, this was suggested as an exercise once for a class that I, I was involved with. Take some great songs. Try and obliterate what the, what the lyric is and write your own lyric to that tune knowing it's not going to be published, but just as an exercise, uh, what does the music say to me? What could I write if I had the job to write it? Um, then, then when you write, to realize that although it's a long shot that you're going to get on Broadway, once in a while uh, a rarity will happen, something like the current show You're in Town, which they never thought was going to wind up on Broadway, but it did and it's a big hit. But without thinking in terms of Broadway, you think, 
uh, did I go to a college which does these shows? I've been working all over the country in colleges and find that uh, there are good directors, there are, there are good talents, and that is a wonderful introduction because the important thing is to see your work in front of an audience. And keep finding finding places f to see it in front of an audience. Right. Uh, That's great. I you, think we, ha we have to stop. We could go on all afternoon. Oh, okay. But I think we have to stop. Thank you, Sheldon, very much. Uh, we've been talking with But Lyricist. I didn't say I know. I know. We'll have to come back. <laughs> I've been talking with lyricist Sheldon Harnick. For the American Theatre Wing, I'm Ted Chapin. Thanks. The American Theatre Wing's Guide to Careers in the Theatre is a project of the American Theatre Wing and the New York Public Library's Billy Rose Theatre Collection, Theater on Film and Tape Archive.